and welcome to the 13th Destiny Podcast. This is part two of our guest, and I'm going to play something special for you. Ready, set, go! <laughs> South Central Kentucky is a man Folks call him lucky At fighting off coyotes With his hands A guy Living out a dream On the side of a stream A life Others don't understand James Magnum He's not your regular Joe James Magnum He's always on the go He'll shoot you with his camera You can run, but you can't hide James Magnum Private Eye Athena, his partner in crime She waits out in the drive For another mission to unfold Models and caliber films Are just another side of him there's more to his story than can be told. James Magnum, he's not your regular Joe. James Magnum, he's always on the go. He'll shoot you with his camera. You can run, but you can't hide. James Magnum, private eye. Dashing across the country, he may show up at your door. Seeking adventure, a life that's never bored. James Magnum, he's not your regular Joe. James Magnum. He's always on the go. He'll shoot you with his camera. You can run, but you can't hide. James Magnum, private eye. James Magnum, he's not your regular Joe. James Magnum, he's always on the go. He'll shoot you with his camera. You can run, but you can't hide. James Magnum. Private Eye Down in South Central Kentucky is a man Folks call him lucky At fighting off coyotes With his hands <laughs> Alright So uh, We're not going to play that anymore This is part two And the guest is you got it, James Magnum. Thank you. Cook. Thank for having me Hi. back. Thanks for Are having. You there? I am here. Thank you for having me back on the second part of this. Um, and I do appreciate being interviewed, and I do appreciate everything that has uh, been here so far. And we will get into a few juicy details, and then we'll jump into a lot of positive stuff. So uh, ask away about some stuff from uh, 94 to 95, and then we'll get back home here. <laughs> well, but didn't we? We left off. And, okay, so let's, I'm going to recap, just in case someone's watching, listening to part two, and so, okay. you were the youngest private, so you were born in Kentucky, yes, in Bowling Green, mm-hmm. you were the, uh, you got, you got your Eagle Scout at 18, mm-hmm. yeah. you were the youngest private investigator at 18 years old, yeah. and you started your training at 17, yes. You then you moved to Georgia and you were the youngest president and CEO of a security uh, consultant agency. Mm-hmm. Then after that, you were the youngest candidate on the ballot for the city commissioner at age twenty-three in Georgia. Yes, and then I think. 
Okay, so what about, did you get to surviving two attempts on your life? No, right? Uh, yeah, there was, uh, now the one attempt, the one attempt that's on my life is we never, these people never showed up, but we know that uh, when what had happened was, this was in 94, and there had been some death threats. Been now this, excuse me, real second, now this is, are these the threats? Uh, well, one, well, this is what we consider was going to be a first attempt on my life, and then we'll get with the second attempt. Now, what I will talk about is that we have never, and I'll be honest, and I talked to an attorney this morning about some of the stuff that we're going to talk about. Um, and so, I, so if you, if I have to stop for a minute, it's because I got to remember what I've been told to say. To uh, you know, because there's some things that can't 100. Like if it was in a court of law, we couldn't 100 percent prove everything I'm going to be talking about, other than the stuff that I had directed at me directly. Uh, there are some things that came forward later. If we will say they would be hearsay evidence, and some of that could be thrown out. Uh, so we make that. We'll make that clear. We'll make that clear. Um, but these are the things that the first things that. I couldn't always match up. Uh, now the 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 death threats were a known known. They were known to Stevens County uh, uh, sheriffs and uh, Tacoma Police Department. And they were aware of these death threats um, because they. I mean, you know, I talked to them about them. <coughs> Excuse me. So they were aware of a couple of death threats early on in '94. Um, and then there was a there, there, there was a night uh, that we got called. It was around uh, around the time of June of '94. Um, and I was with my parents, and we got called, um, or I got called, or whatever. And uh, I was with, and uh, this particular person who apparently knew way too much about me. This is why we say we never could match it up. Um, this was a female voice that said that uh, this was this kind of like almost kind of like this childhood girlfriend from Kentucky that I had had. And I hadn't, I hadn't had contact with her for some time. And, of course, I said, you don't quite sound like yourself. And, oh, I've been sick. This is what she was saying on the phone. And uh, she was supposedly coming into Georgia at this bus station in another county. And she was coming in on the last bus that night. Right now, so this is this is in '94. You know, we don't have the tech at that time that we do now. You know, unless someone's on a phone for a long period back then, you know, you, things were a lot harder to trace. So some of the quick death threats, various things that have, and uh, she didn't really want to talk that long. But I kind of I couldn't tell for sure whether or not it was her or not. And so, but I really wanted to see this person because I hadn't seen this person for years. And uh, this person said, hey, I'll clear, clear everything up that happened when you were in Kentucky last with me. So this person knew that I had been in Kentucky with this person around the age of uh, 21. And, uh, you know, so I kind of thought it was her. I just thought, okay, I'm going to go along with it. You know, that she's sick. Um, so I'm talking, to my, I'm talking to my dad, and my dad is like, uh, hey, this don't sound right. I was like, oh, it's fine. And I won't mention what her name is either. A lot of people know what her name is that you know grew up here around with me here in Kentucky. Um, but uh, I said, no, oh, no, it's fine. It's her. She's just not. Feel he said it doesn't add up. My dad said, you know, and and, and he was right. Uh, I guess, you know. I said, I got this. I, I. He said, I don't want you going alone. It's a lot. I said, you want to go with me, really? And uh, me and my dad. I mean, I love my dad, and we had some ups and downs in our lives. But at this point, I was just kind of like, "Oh boy, here we go." Uh, I said, "Okay." I finally agreed to let him go with me. And then uh, this is where this is where it gets even more dicier. Um, of course, we've had the couple of death threats, and he said, "This doesn't add up." He, Are you sure it's her? And I, I said, "You know what? I'm not 100 percent sure it's her." He said, "Well, you've already got these death threats, so we need to, you know, be more cautious." Now, this is a time when me and my dad were kind of on again, off again sometimes, but we, we got along. We got along, okay. Um, but um, we, got, we both have 38 revolvers with us uh, on this particular night uh, that we go. And the way this place is where we went to, uh, it's kind of down an uh, incline on one side and an incline on the other side. So we got on the other side. And we were waiting and waiting. And uh, finally, the last bus comes in and uh, she doesn't get off the bus. Now, I'm going to be there alone. Now, you think about this. He was right because I was going to be there alone. She never got off, the person that's supposedly supposed to be coming to see me. And uh, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This gets this gets very dicey really quick. Now, again, when we get into 95, we can't 100% connect the two things. But I'm involved with someone uh, in business stuff already that we have an up and down kind of uh, relationship kind of thing, uh, business relationship. And sometimes... Uh, this person did know enough about me that it could have been re 
uh, related to what's coming up next. But we never could prove it. Um, and so I'm just going to be honest with what I talked to the attorney this morning. You know, you've got to be very cautious of what I'm saying here because we never could prove the connection uh, on this. But there's a lot of stuff that happens in 95, early 95, that makes me, even to this day, go back and wonder. So we're there. We wait. She never gets off the bus. So the bus leaves. And we wait till the, you know, well, well maybe something just, and I, so uh, I started to get out. And I didn't get out. And all of a sudden, this car shows up after everyone else is gone, coming down from the other side. And they looked, and we never could see who was in the car. And I, this is this is this is what floored me. From the distance and the angle we were at, we couldn't see for sure who was in the car. We just know there was a male, and we think maybe a female, but we couldn't tell. And they just backed up fast. They backed up fast when they realized. And my dad said they can see us. Uh, he said there. He said that car. Uh, he said may have been for you. And I was like, no, oh, come on. Maybe it's just a coincidence. And he said, really? You think this is a coincidence with everything that's happened in the last, you know, six months? And then this happens. And then this car is backing out fast. And um, I'm like, okay, so maybe it's related to people who are trying to, you know, threaten my life and various things. Which I was just shocked when I first got the first death threat. I. Um, to be completely honest with you, I actually laughed the first time I got a first death threat. I did. It didn't even I, because there was another guy that was also associated with this other person who uh, called me one day when I was at Western Sicily working and literally said that he was going to come down there and I'll be honest, he's going to come down there and kick my ass. And I told him, I said, "Well, look, man, I'm here to like uh, three o'clock in the afternoon and just come on down." I was that was that gung ho back then. Like you know, you want to come challenge me? Come, I'll be right here. I'm not leaving anywhere. But this person, other person who uh, had stirred up some stuff with him, stirred up, unbeknown to me till later, uh, trying to say that I was messing around with his wife. And I, I, she just worked there. I didn't even have anything. So anyway, the car backs out. We'll go back to that real quick. And uh, I just let that go. Uh, but, you know, later on, I will say, you know, all this may have been connected. All of this may have been connected. Uh it's one of those things where you can't connect the dots to everything. And it's just kind of like, I know what I went through. I know what I was under. And uh, it's, it's, it was just, it was about to become a, what I would have considered to be like the best time in my life towards the end of uh, 94 into 95. But apparently, no, it was going to be uh, what I would be later told was kind of like a psychological warfare that I went through. And, um, I will be honest with you, to all that stuff and all that success and being an investigator and all that, I was ill-prepared for everything that was coming at me. And uh, that's the complete honesty there that I was so unprepared for this. I will tell you that today I am 20 times better than what I was back then. I was not as good as I thought I was, and that is, that is, that is where it's going to be used against me. I, um, these early successes may have made me somewhat, um, at the time more um, on the side of arrogance. I will be honest about that. Um, because I thought, oh, I've done this, I've done that. You know, I've got this under control. Well, this particular, I should have, from this incident, from this incident alone, I should have been more prepared in towards the end of 94 into 95. And I wasn't. And I, um, I always go back on this and I look at this and I say, I am lucky to be alive, number one. I am lucky not to be in prison. We'll bring that up in a minute. I am just so lucky that the, and I kind of like the fact that Rick put lucky in his about the cat, but that, but in a way, it also plays into just how lucky I have been on some things. So this is my story. They had they had, they had chances to challenge things. So uh, again, we won't name any names. Uh, we'll just put the relationship is with me, and then we'll go into that. Um, so um, so towards the end of 1994. Now, then remember, I've already been, I've already had this person, uh, not knowing whether or not this person did, but already had something set up on me with, from the death threats to the, um, the, the fake girl, you know, the, the fake show up of the girlfriend that never showed up, right? All this. So, you know, this was definitely a setup. So, I'm about to be alone, though. My parents are about to go back to Kentucky, and I'm about to get married. So, um, you know, in my life, my, my life had suddenly turned around as far as I was concerned. Now, again, I should have listened. 
and I didn't. And like I said, I was a little, I was a little gung ho about some things. And like I said, I'm 20 times better today. And that's not arrogance, dogs. That's experience talking. That's because I went through this hell. Okay. So, because uh, I would get death threats during the Magnum models, and I was able to just pop those, go to the police. I just didn't do things as well as I would do later because I had went through the crap I went through. And um, so, uh, so, I'm, so this particular woman shows up where I'm working part time. Um, I had left the Western Citizen, of course. I still own the, the security so uh, excuse me, still own the security consultant firm. So I'm still involved with stuff like, but it's just not. It's just not as much. It's not, I was kind of transitioning out of that. And then at one point, I'm going to want to go home. Uh, I'm just wanting to. I'm just at one point. I'm just so worn down from everything that's about to happen to me. I just really want to go home, but I am so not myself. I am so messed up, and I'm being honest about it. I was so messed up. I, there were days that I couldn't even tell you what happened on those days, um, and we'll get into that in a minute. So anyway, um, my parents were still there at first when uh, me and her first met, um, and uh, we got together pretty quick, and uh, we ended up getting married pretty quick. And uh, part of the, and I think looking back on it now, I go. You know, and my dad would say later, he said, I'm really sorry that I pushed you about not marrying her. He said, maybe if I hadn't, uh, uh, I mean, my dad was honest about this uh, later on with everything that happened later. Uh, and I mean, me and my dad still had some ups and downs, but in the as, as you well know, in the end of his life, I, I was well taken care of him and I love my dad very much. But we we were too much alike on some things and too different on other things. And uh, he would even mention that himself. Um, so I get married. Um and they're not really happy about this because this has just been a whirlwind. She, and she came in with, uh, she came in with too much knowledge of me too. But she claimed that uh, it was all in the papers, which a lot of what she said was in the papers. But looking back on it now, I realized she knew way too much. So she was well versed when she met me, well versed. And I didn't catch it because she, I mean, she's talking, about, oh, I know who you are. You're in the papers all the time, and da 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 da. da. So, uh, and she was, she was that that part was true. I was in the papers all the time. You know, every couple of weeks at one point, uh, I was in the paper, either either writing a letter or being either various things. And I had just announced I was going to run for the open city commission uh, spot again, uh, not the one that Lee was on because Lee and me had become friends. So there was another one that had opened up, and. Uh, the early polls did indicate that I had a pretty good shot of winning this, so uh, that we had done. So, again, thinking I can do all of this and everything's good and I'm good to go, not having any clue that everything that's about to happen is about to turn my life upside down. So, uh, and at one point, I will be honest, um, I was almost suicidal at one point during all of this because. I just was getting bombarded with everything under the sun from different sides, and I, and you I'm. Mean after the marriage. Do what now? You mean after the marriage? Was yes, uh, they they the person that she ends up with is is the business uh, associate. Uh, okay, we'll talk about that. And um, unknown, unbeknown to me, and this is fact. This is this is fact. So he can't challenge it. Unbeknown to me, uh, he's a uh, two-time convicted felon. I did not know this one. I never checked this because we were introduced from both, both parents, uh, both moms, and I never checked into his background because why? Why would I? Uh, this was at a, a church thing. I didn't think anything of it. Uh, you know. And again, I look back on that and I go, oh my God, I trusted my mom a little bit too much back then too. You know, uh, you know, it's something I wouldn't do. To, not that I wouldn't trust my mom and dad. Don't get me that wrong. But it, I, today, I would not get into a situation where I'd check in everything under the sun, you know, uh, about this person. You know, do you have any kind of criminal record? Do you have anything that's going to cause me problems down the road? Um, and the fact that the other person, that the one that Steve was going to enter and kick my ass and all that stuff that day, this person was also a friend of this guy. So you put the death, like I said, having a really hard time connecting the dots because none of this was ever connected. But if you put two and two together, it kind of sounds like four, doesn't it? Because this person's making that initial threat and everything, and then there's death threats, and then there's this setup, and then the next thing you know, this new girl comes into my life who is just... Like, stroking my ego like you would not believe. And I'm 26 years old. I've had all this. And I'm like, hey, I'd had a really bad relationship in just recent history. Another thing this other person knew. So this person comes into my life and just, like, 
and I'm all for this, right? So this is this is this is where this is going to be the biggest mistake I could have made. I should have been prepared. I was not prepared for any of this. Um, and it's been a very long time for me to talk about this to anybody. Uh, there are certain members of law enforcement in that county, and some of them are retired now, that know about parts of this and are well aware of this. Uh, again, some of the stuff they didn't connect either until later on, but statute of limitations are out. This is something else I was to mention. Statute of limitations are out on pretty much everything. There's nothing we really can go back on this stuff. Um, but uh, I'm the one, I'm not going to be the one that takes the abuse the most. I'm going to be the one that takes it and takes it and takes it to the point that my head's spun around. Um, because I was, I thought I was madly in love with this woman. I did. I actually, and, and, and let me be clear here. I actually do not have any animosity towards her whatsoever. On the other side, there's a different story. Because I feel, I feel like maybe she was manipulated and used as well during this time. Uh, she had some. Uh, she had some issues. Uh, she was drawing money from the government, so let's put it that way. I feel like that she was being used and manipulated as much as anybody else. Um, again, this is my opinion. Uh, that's an opinion. I don't know for sure, and that would be hearsay in a court of law as well. Um, but this is my story, and this is what happened to me, and this is this is why I say this is my story. And this is how it's been told for the last almost 30 years. I have not wavered from this one bit. Uh, there are people here that know about this. There are people back there that know about this. And so if I haven't wavered in this story in almost 30 years, there, I'm not going to today. So, uh, But I just didn't talk about it openly a lot. I talked about it to certain people. I talked about certain friends of mine in law enforcement and things over the years. And there's some things that came uh, forward in the 15 to 20 year span after I first left and that's why I ended up going back one time early on with my dad because there were stories going around that people didn't know what was going uh, had happened and I'm like saying that I couldn't come to Georgia saying that I was like you want to this is the, this is the, some of the stupidest stuff uh, like I, like I'm banned from the state of Georgia this is happening uh, this is happening a few months after I had come home and we'll get to why they're saying the you know because I just so you, okay, so you're done. You're done with the wife thing. You got divorced, right? Uh, yeah, but here's the problem. I'm still involved with him and her, uh, in a way because I've got some business stuff with him. Uh, I've got money, some money tied up with him. Money that, and and when we get to the part where he caved, when the uh, when the sheriff's detective went out there and confronted him when I was in jail, uh, they that's when that's when he ca when he caved and they paid the money. Uh, I think that tells the whole story. You know that they knew they were involved with this part uh, way heavier than uh, was known, and then they had also possibly now this is alleged. I cannot prove this. They were probably involved with all this other stuff that was going on, uh, but I couldn't prove it. Now there's a couple people that came forward later that indicated uh, one of them was one of her former friends and said that uh, that she knew well about some stuff and she gave me she gave me some stuff but it was past statute of limitations and the only question I asked her I said why didn't you come to me sooner and she said well I was scared of him and I was like well, I get that I get that you know and uh, you know and I think she was too. I think the ex was too. She finally has broken from the. Uh, but anyway, that's but that's another. That's that's their that's their story. That's not my story. My story starts here. On uh, January 12, 1995, we got married, and uh, everything's great. Couldn't be better. You know, I I thought my life was uh, changing for the best. You know, death threats had had not come up in a while. Uh, nothing was going on, and. Uh, on January thirteenth, January thirteenth, I'm uh, we having a discussion about work, about you need to work and all, and she just I don't know she became a different person, or as far as I know, this could not be proven whether or not this was set up either, but um, she just started getting mad and madder and madder and madder and started cussing me and a bunch of other stuff and then she uh, she puts pulls his drawer knives open, throws throws knives at me. I, I dodged every one of them. And then she grabs one and comes at me. And comes. this is like a domestic violence like you would not believe. And I'm just like, I'm freaked out because I've never dealt with this. I've never dealt with anything like this. And, uh, I mean, I thought I was madly in love with her. So, uh, and uh, she ends up coming over the top of me. And I ended up getting it stopped in a very unique way. Let's just put it this way. As the comment was made, I said, one of us is probably going to die tonight. And I don't plan on it being me. And uh, she stopped. So, um, 
And then it was like on the third day, she was like back to normal. She was like, you know, it was just like, what the hell has just happened here? I don't even know what. Now, my mind's getting twisted one one way or another just with this, let alone anything else that's about to come at me. And uh, I was like, oh, my God, what have I got myself into? And, of course, before it's over, my parents are gone. I'm alone. Um, this uh, business person, uh, associate, comes back into the picture Um and they're a little too friendly with each other. Let's put it that way. And uh, one thing leads to another. Eventually, um, you know, I'm being, I'm, I'm losing my mind, literally. I'm being hit from every side under the sun. I do not have, what I should have done, uh, as I said, I'm 20 times better now today. What I should have done was I should have come home. I should have just come home. And later, but I had been given some information that was wrong um, about I couldn't leave until the divorce was over and all this other stuff. That was BS too. That was just more BS being put out there. There was so many things, stories going around about what was going on between the three of us. And I'm telling you right now, I don't even know half of what was going on because another thing alleged uh, from hearsay and hearsay that came forward later indicated that I might have been drugged during part of this. I cannot prove that. Uh, I was never tested. I did get extremely sick when I came home several times, throwing up a bunch of other stuff that didn't make sense. Uh, one particular person had said it sounded like withdrawal. Uh, whether that was just from the mental state that I had went through or whether it was possibly that it was drugs too. I don't know because I never I never used an illegal drug in my life, <laughs> so I have no idea. I wasn't used to anything about withdrawal. I never even really drank. Uh, you know, I mean, I drank a little a day here right now. You know that. But, I mean, I don't, I don't drink enough. Like my dad used to joke, he said, you don't drink enough that uh, you could put that in a baseball cap here. So I was definitely not in my right state of mind. Uh, and whether or not how much of what the story of what the person told me is true and uh, all that is very hard to prove. And like I said, this has been almost 30 years now. So, I mean, this is way statute of limitations. There's really nothing I could do anyway. And, and they know that. And uh, I, I pretty much let them go on living their life. But let's talk about the things that would happen during this time frame. So... We ended up, um, I finally, I finally, she moved in with him while we were still married. We were still married, moved in with him. I still got business uh, things with him. I still have to deal with him. Now, here we are with soon to be my ex-wife, and she's moved in with him. So, oh, you want to talk about messing with your head. That will mess with your, anybody's head. I don't, I don't care who you are. So that's the first part. And then, um, and then there was other stuff going on, and uh, we were... Um, so I got divorced on March 30th, 1995, and we were all at a location together the following day. And uh, he sent me away to pick up some stuff uh, for this particular uh, place we were at in Commerce, Georgia. And so I'm going the opposite direction of where. So you know, and people saw where I was at. People knew where I was at. Aren't Clyde Alibi to start with, but I'm about to be hit with an additional psychological thing because they're going to use this against me even though it's going to be ruled as an accident. But a day after my divorce, here's, here's what happens the day after my divorce. So I'm in Athens, Georgia, and uh, I went to Athens, which is south of the Commerce store that we were working there that day. And uh, I come back. They're gone. This is April, this is April 1st, 1995. They're gone. I'm like, Whoa. I've already been listening to crap about, oh, he's his, that's his, his ex-wife. It's already, it's already affecting me. It's already affecting my mind. So my mind's about to get really, really screwed up. Uh, you know, even though when this incident happens, I know that I'm not guilty, but that doesn't mean anything. You know, in these, you know, and we well know in true crime things that that don't always hold up. You know, just because you know, and sometimes, uh, like I've, you know, known since much better. Like some of my police officer friends now say, "Man, you were so lucky that you just didn't go ahead and get an attorney right then, regardless of being, you know, knowing you weren't guilty." Um, but, um, what happens is they, um, uh, they, they, they were living together. I get back to the store and uh, they're not there. And I ask them, I say, Hey, where's, uh, where are they at? I won't name their names. And, uh, the people next door have been making jokes about everything. They were like, Oh, uh, they had to go back to the place where we, you know, the county we lived in because their house is on fire. I'm like, Oh no. Oh no. Like this is the day after my divorce. So with what background I have, and all my, my mind's already messed up, I go, oh, this is not good. This is not good at all. And uh, so I did have enough of my mindset still left at this point 
to realize that this was a you know on the surface would be a bad situation right so uh, I'm just like geez what in the hell you know is going on by the time I get back it is gone the house which is basically a trailer it's it's gone it's to the ground and I'm like I'm he had like a circle of driveway I pulled in there he comes running down the hill and he told me uh, this is his comment to me his very comment to me was you need to get the hell out of here and I'm like why I was like, you know where I was at. He said, yeah, but my mom's wanting to get you arrested. Thanks, you uh, had this either done it or had it done. Uh, I said, well, first off, you know where I was at. You sent me. You asked me to go the opposite direction. So how would I make it here in the time frame? So that would that would be the first thing. I already knew that I couldn't have made it in the time frame. Uh, and where I had been at with witnesses in Athens, Georgia, I was sitting there going, oh, my God, this is ridiculous. But then I'm getting a little scared. I drive away. And then uh, I go to work that night, and by the time I get to work, everybody in this town is talking about this shit. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, but uh, they're all talking about this, and uh, I go to work, and this guy's uh, this one particular guy, he's saying something about, oh, man, you're going to go to prison. Everyone knows you've done it. Everybody knows you did it. Everybody, It's like, oh, my God, what the, what the, what do I got myself into here? First off, I actually lost stuff, which no one no one ever asked this question. I actually had stuff in his house that belonged to me that I lost in this as well. So, like, like I don't care. I wasn't even mad at anybody. So, why I was happy just to be, why would I do something when I'm not even mad? I'm not even upset with, as far as I knew. You know, I wasn't upset with anybody. I mean, I was upset I was divorced. I was upset with some of the stuff. But I wasn't upset to that kind of level. And, um... So I'm just waiting and I'm waiting and I went and I'm dealing with all this stuff. I'm being hit now. I'm being hit by these people saying you're going to prison and all this stuff. And uh, I'm just like, oh my god, here we go, here we go. So I started think uh, I really wasn't in my. I really this is where I began to not be in my mindset at all. I'm already freaking out, thinking I'm done. You know, thinking there's no way I can prove this other than the alibis where I'm at. You know, and the fact that you. But then he had thrown in the hoe, or you had it done, kind of thing. You know. Uh, well, first off, um, all I did the day before was we got the divorce. You actually called me. Uh, you asked you asked me if I was going to be at the location the next day, and then you sent me away from the location, going in the opposite direction. I'm thinking all this through my head. You know, even though my mind is just, my mind's just wasted at this time. I'm just, I'm just gone. And um, so I got a call uh, late that night. Uh, the manager had indicated that uh, he was on the phone. And uh, my thought process was that he had called to say, well, they're on their way to arrest you. And this is what I thought. This is where I first, and this, uh, this will come up later, that we don't know what all transpired with all these other things that happened. We can't, and no one could ever connect dots with anything. But um, the uh, the fire marshal ruled early on, was able to rule early on that this was an electrical fire, an overload of surge plugs that had been plugged in and overloaded uh, that were old, and uh, that was the hot spot. And this is what they ruled, and uh, that it was an accident, that there was no way that it was said that it was an accident. And I was like, <sighs> you want to talk about being relieved? At the same, but at the same time, yeah, yeah, but at the same time, all this is going through your head about how close this was, you know, and um, so um, I stay associated with them, and at this same time, during this, this April month, a couple of weeks later, uh, I am so messed up with these people, and uh, they're just asking me some questions about, you know, some things. And, uh, you know, we still, I still had, I still had money as far as I knew at this point and everything, but I'm not checking that. I, I'm just to a point where I don't care anymore. And, uh, I ended up, uh, I ended up being with them and ended up writing a lot of checks, uh, for, and ended up not having the money. Um, ended up, uh, I would get charged. I would get, well, I didn't really get charged. I guess they had like, uh, they had like three warrants. They never, there was never really any charges because I don't have a, I don't have a criminal record. Uh, I was never fingerprinted. I was never, but I was detained for four days. The reason I was detained, and this is a this is a part of the story that a lot of people don't understand. They're like, well, obviously they took you in handcuffs and they took you to the jail, and I'm like, yeah. But here's the part of the story where it gets very interesting. So this is by this is in May. I have not lied one bit about I'm leaving for Kentucky. Now. What happens here is that uh, this particular uh, person I'm uh, and have a business associate with, 
I tell him uh, at one point, I tell him, I was like, look, man, we need to settle up with this money. We need, and he's like, oh, yeah, it'll be fine. Well, the night I was telling him this, um, the deputy showed up for me, unbeknown to me, you know, that they were there for me. I didn't know they were there for me. Uh, my, my mind's gone by this time. My mind is just, but I'm still enough myself. But what I said about I was suicidal um, at one point during the, the month of April when the Oklahoma City bombing happened, I took three days off and I literally was just kind of in darkness for three days and I was just so messed. I just didn't want to be bothered by anybody. And um, I just really at one point just, I will say that I was suicidal at one point because they, they had me so messed up. And uh, I didn't do it, obviously, because I'm here or we would be talking about this. But I was, I was so drunk, I was so to the ground that when I went back to work, um, I walked in and I saw all this and I was like, I was just noticing and just as I was walking out, I was like, when did that happen? And then someone made the statement, they're like, uh, where have you been? That happened three days ago. Oh. <laughs> so you, you would think that at this point in my mind, you would think that I, that I realize I'm kind of messed up, but I'm just, I'm just going through the motions. I'm just going through the motions. I'm not even, it's kind of like where people say, you know, they were there, but they really don't know what they were doing. And yeah, I, yeah, the, the therapist I would talk to later kind of said, that's kind of where you were at. And if she said, if drugs were involved too, she said, you are very lucky to be alive. And uh, so that's, that's, that's what that part is. And um, Okay, so now you go home? Not yet. Um, I'm going to end up spending four days in jail. So... Um, I'm with them that night when I'm trying to tell them. And this is the proof in the pudding with the local law enforcement at the time. They knew this guy. They knew about him. And the fact that he caved, okay, what happens first is they take me to the jail. But on the way to the jail, uh, the ex is already freaking out. Because uh, I think she knew more than she was letting on. But, again, we can't prove that. This is just from what the, the 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 parts that transpired we go well obviously she knew something more than because you're freaking out and you're calling my attorney before i ever get to the jail this is an ex why would you freak out and why would you call the attorney unless you were worried and so that's so that's the part that i say there's got to be something to that because you had to be worried you had to be worried this was going to come back on you or whatever else may have been going on at the time again a lot of hearsay, a lot of uh, stuff that was hard to connect, uh, but it was a very dark time. I'll, I'll say it was like the darkest hours of my life, and uh, which should have been the you know should have been the happiest one you know after you first married and all that stuff. But uh, this was the darkest time of my life, and because uh, I've never been in any trouble of any type other than speeding, so no, I, this made no sense. And even the local uh, law enforcement knew that something wasn't right, but they just couldn't get everything together. Uh, and the main thing is my attorney wanted me out of, um, he wanted me out, he wanted me out of Georgia for a while, but now nah, I wasn't banned, but the, the story gets told that I'm banned. I'm like, I'm like, what? I'm banned from the state of Georgia. Come on. That's like stupid. That's not true. There's, there's no record. There's no, there's no reason to ban me from coming to the state of Georgia unless my life was in danger. Now, now I, I, and they wouldn't ban me. They would just say, be cautious. You know, <laughs> when you come, you know, I always, I always get a kick out of this story. The part that, um, and, uh, the, uh, the owner uh, girlfriend of one of the restaurants I used to work for was the one that started this story and she was saying he's banned from Georgia he can't come back with all the trouble he caused I said here going when this story got to me in Kentucky this is where I kind of laughed about that part of it I was like well, whatever and I showed back up I showed back up and went into the restaurant and she just happened to be there and I was like hey how you doing I was with my dad of course and uh, and uh, she had the look on her face was like, does he know I've been telling this story? And I'm thinking to myself, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to eat and just like not say a word. But yeah, I know you've been telling this story because the look on your face told everything. <laughs> so she, uh, it was, it was fun. It was funny in a way because her look gave her away. Um, but anyway, back to this part, uh, back to the other part, back to the final negative part of the story. So uh, when they showed up that night, uh, the first uh, deputy, um, and I will name him as Addison, uh, as it was his last name, he comes over to me, he's talking to me, and he said, hey, can I talk to you outside? And, yeah, sure, man, why not, man? Now they know I'm leaving tomorrow, the next day. They, they knew I was leaving because I didn't hide I was leaving. Um, and uh, I, had, I had no clue what was about to happen. So I get out there, I notice these two deputies were coming in and closing behind me before they went over to the bar, and I'm like, uh, they're playing a joke on me. That's what—that's kind of what I thought because I was associated with the uh, sheriff's son, who's now sheriff and all. So I mean, I didn't think anything of this. I didn't think anything of it at all. And uh, he asked me. He said, uh, 
he said, where's your gun at? And I said, well, the one I have is in the car. And uh, he said, well, you're under arrest. And I was like, what? I started laughing. I was like, under arrest for what? And he pops up these three warrants that they have for me on these bad checks. And I'm like, he said, everything. I said, yeah, those are my I said, why are you saying that? And uh, he said, well, because you have no money and you have like hundreds of these out. That's what he said, hundreds. Uh, which, there was a lot out. There wasn't quite the number he was saying. But, uh, and I'm like, uh-huh. All of a sudden, I'm just getting quiet. I'm like, whoa, what the... So, I get cuffed. He puts me in the back of the car. Now, this is a well-known... This is a person well knows that I've done tricks over the years of getting out of handcuffs. Makes a statement to the point of, hey, what's going on? Da-da-da-da. And by the way, don't you try to get out of your handcuffs because I know that you know that there's you have several you've been able to get out of. I'm like, well, I'm not doing that because I've just put me in more trouble. <laughs> right? So, but uh, he's not getting any answers from me because I don't have the answers. Well, by the time we get there... We go in and uh, Deputy Black, he says something about processing me and he said, I can't process him yet. And he said, what do you mean you can't process him? He says, his attorney's on his way. So what do you mean he's been in the car with me? How could his attorney be on the way? He said, well, apparently um, his wife, that's what that's what he said. He said his wife called. Now, of course, that's not my wife anymore, but apparently she calls the attorney and is freaking out with the attorney. Now, that should tell anyone, if you're freaking out that much with the attorney, you're worried not about me, but you're worried about yourself. You're really worried about yourself. You have to be worried about yourself. Because you could care less. Unless something's going to come back and bite you on the, you know. And, and I'm just like, what? Well, the, the weirdest thing, the weirdest things that happen after he leaves and everything. And he was in an agitated state over this whole thing, too, by the way. You know, I won't talk about everything that happened there. Um, you know, because he's, I'm pretty sure he's retired and gone from all that now. I know he's not a part of that department anymore. Well, uh, he comes over. The other one comes over and takes the cuffs off of me. Doesn't even have me cuffed. I'm not even. I'm not even cuffed anymore. He's like he said. Well, I'm comfortable with you. I said I'm not worried about you. That ought to tell you something else. All this going on. I'm like what the hell is going? On? <laughs> like this is the weirdest freaking night of all time. So, um, so this will be more of a detainment than it is a true arrest, true booking, or stuff like that. And there are people that know the story, and there are people that would say, well, you have no record. You have." I was like, I don't, because it was all cleared. It was all cleared up, at least my part of it anyway. And, um, you know, and I had to, I did have to make financial restitution because I did sign the checks. I did sign them. So I'll be honest. I mean, I signed them. Uh, but going back, obviously I was under duress and, you know, and a lot of stuff that has come forward later that I didn't know about. And that's one of the reasons talking to my attorney this morning was saying be real careful about you know not naming any names. But this this story is your story, and uh, but we just don't want to name the names of the people. Um, other than you know the ones that are officials that were involved, with, that's fine because I'm still friends with one who is the current sheriff of that county, and I've gone back several times to see him as a friend. Um, and I should be really thankful that I had these friends even then because. A lot of time, law enforcement, and it's no offense to them, they do their job. They can't just go to bat for you. And they kind of did. And they uh, also, a judge did, And after my family had showed up, and saying there's more to this. And uh, when the, uh, the uh, sheriff's detective went out and asked some questions and, and warned this particular person, like, if you don't cough this up, uh, you're going to go back to prison yourself. It ain't going to just be, you know, and so... Very quickly, family, the other family coughed up the money to put money with the, my family's money to make this restitution, uh, which pretty much tells you that when he caved that quickly, I mean, this isn't, according to the story I got, it was with a five-minute cave. Five-minute talk, and he caved. That tells you all you need to know right there that this person was obviously involved a lot deeper with a lot more stuff going on than I was aware. And... Um, and when my head started to clear, when I came back to Kentucky and my head started to clear, I would eventually start doing, uh, I, I did actually go back into private investigation a little bit and also in the process serving. But so I did have access to some things and I did a little bit more checking over the years. But it took 15, between 15 and 20 years in that, in that time frame to get one person to come forward that knew some stuff that I didn't know anything about. And by the time she did, I'm like, I can't use this. I can't. I can't use this. There's no way I can use it. And of course, the, sh the current sheriff he knows about this, and uh, we've t we've kind of briefly talked. And I've thanked him and his family many times uh, because they didn't have to help me. They obviously, I mean, but they knew there was something wrong. They did. They knew. They knew something was wrong. Um, 
And uh, that's a good thing. I will admit I am very thankful that they did what they did. Um, and I wouldn't be here talking to this day. I may be. I, I'm a, I, don't, I don't know how my life would have played out had this not went the way it went. So that was the end of the story. I come home. I took a transfer from so the. How did you get? How did you get out of? So you can wrap it up today because we're going to do part three. We're going to do part three. It's that bad. I'm like, no, we're not going to have. Yeah, we're not going to. But um, from everything that you've said so far, um, do you consider your life up until that point? Positive? Uh, my life up until that. Negative, yeah. Was it like yes. Uh, my life up. Particular time, and how did you turn? For it, like when you got really, really down, and mm-hmm. how did you turn your life around? How did you? Did you get counseling? I, I did talk to did a therapist. Did you go to therapy? I did actually talk to a therapist uh, about this stuff. Is that that one therapist you told me? About? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it is. <laughs> that you have to tell that uh, but Go she ahead. but she did she did indicate that she thought I had been under a psychological warfare that's what she called it she said uh, she said uh, she thought that they might have been using uh, what therapists were not supposed to use uh, dark tactics uh, dark psychology stuff that I've also like looked into since I've read some stuff on that and looking back on it I would say that damn right they probably did use some dark psychology on me and uh, really get got my mindset messed up that's why I say I'm stronger today with everything I went through and I survived it. Um, it started with the death threats. The death threats, whether or not they could be connected, but the fact that the other person that also directly was going to try to hurt me uh, and was going to come down there because you know I was allegedly messing with his wife and he was friends with this person, that kind of this all transpires in between '94 and '95. So I'm kind of on this roller coaster. I've, but up to that point, yeah, my life had been pretty positive. I mean, yeah, I had some ups and downs, lost a few jobs here and there in between my own stuff, but you know, nothing, nothing negative on the on the level of being in handcuffs and being taken into the jail. I believe, this is just, I mean, I'm, I'm like the youngest private investigator. I'm the youngest security. Cause I'm like, I'm sitting there going to myself going, and I'm sitting in hand, I'm, I'm in handcuffs all of a sudden. And I'm like, what has, what's going on? But I think the handcuffs, the, the initial arrest, which no Miranda, no nothing. That that in itself should have told me there was a lot more going on that they were wanting to get to the bottom of at the time. Uh, but, you know, once you're in handcuffs and you're sitting in the back of a police car and you've all had all these friends in law enforcement, which I have tons of law enforcement friends today, um, it's just like, what uh, exactly has gone on here? What exactly has brought me to this point? You know, how have I gotten, when my, my life is all positive up to this point, and it just goes super negative, like in, what, we're talking less than a five-month span. Less than a five-month span. And nothing matches up to who I was then before that or who I am today. Right. But, okay, okay. But why, what can people bring from this today? Well, for, show? well first off. What did you learn and what, what, how did you turn your life around? Well, before we get like, into, before we do part three, I will tell you this. My life would turn around completely. One of the things I took away from this was be more mindful of who you're dealing with, even if you're in a relationship with them. Uh, I can't say that I never had anything else ever happen bad in a relationship. It has, but not to this level. Not to the level of where I'm in handcuffs. You know, and this all goes back to this just turning upside down and turning upside down and turning upside down. And um, I also like when we we're talking on uh, when we we're talking on the one that's coming up in uh, April. Uh, he's like, kid, you've been fearless. I said, I've been fearless except for that three days that I was just so down I didn't know what to do. But I have been fearless most of my life, and I have you know, taken it to heart. Like, I, I, I tell people all the time, uh, even when I was consulting, and I should have taken this to heart. Like, If someone really wants to do something to you, if someone really wants to kill you or really wants to take you out, you cannot protect yourself from every single thing in the world. It's impossible. The most well-trained Navy SEAL can will tell you in a heartbeat that there's always somebody that can best you at some point if you're not careful. You have to be mindful of these things. Um, and I wasn't as mindful as I am today. But if someone's determined to do something, they're determined. And you just have to put as many barriers in and as much safety as you can and be aware of your surroundings. But yeah, it's it, it will play into this attack, 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 as I will call it, uh, plays into me becoming better, me being better, and turning my life around. 
and I will turn it around in such a short period of time, it's it's amazing how fast I will start to turn things around. And then that will be in the uh, that'll be from the ninety fives to the you know the two thousands area after I go home uh, with a business and stuff. And then eventually we'll get into uh, we'll get into Magnus models and uh, all that stuff. And then how books and various things uh, and things I've been involved with that are all positive. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll wrap it up. Next week for sure. Right. Well, surely by surely by okay. next surely by next week we can get part three, which is by the way, folks, part three is very very positive. <laughs> it's not Aww. it's not all this uh, it's not all this negativity. There was only I will mention there was only one death threat during the Magnum models here, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, we we might, we might talk about that. But no, but that was just a, a, a an ex boyfriend of a model which he, he got taken down for other reasons. Uh, but my you know my police report did kind of like move it along. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah we'll talk uh, we'll talk mostly positive stuff next week because this was the negativity line <laughs> right. but hey okay well thank you yeah thank i'm alive for, um, i'm alive and well speaking, and we will wrap it up next week absolutely uh, thank you everybody for listening absolutely to 13th destiny podcast subscribe and all that good stuff yeah and more stuff coming on that and very soon will- I <laughs> will talk to you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye, right. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks so much.